Okay, um, it's just turned three o'clock here in the UK. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis and I'm a Senior Director of RISTEC uh, based in the UK. Thanks very much for joining us and welcome to this RISTEC seminar. The topic today is really interesting uh, because it's all about us humans uh, and the errors we make. Hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you, uh, you know, both as an individual uh, and also for use in your workplace. Uh, before we get going, a quick spot of housekeeping. Uh, we've muted everybody uh, so that the sound won't be distorted by background noise. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, and we really do encourage you to ask questions, uh, then please use the instant messaging function. So that's that little speech, white speech bubble down in the bottom left hand corner uh, of, of the screen. And what we'll do is I'll keep track of these uh, and we'll aim to cover as many of them as we can at the end of the session. Uh, and certainly within the sort of 35, 40 minutes that uh, we have uh, available. Okay, Derek, could you just uh, advance the slides, please? Okay, so just for, for those of you who don't know Risk Tech, uh, just very, very quickly, I just introduce us. Um, we've over 300 people working across 16 offices worldwide, uh, and we are part of TV Rhineland, uh, who are a 2 billion euro provider of testing, inspection, and certification services. Uh, we, pr we provide a number of business lines. The main activity is consulting, where we provide a, a pretty broad range of risk and safety management services. Uh, that the focus on delivering proportionate solutions very much uh, aimed towards helping our clients reduce and manage risk. Uh, we also do a lot of online and classroom training uh, and postgraduate education. Uh, we also provide resources, so associates uh, who can actually work at client locations where the client might have uh, uh, a resource uh, shortage or a skill shortage. We also provide uh, industrial inspections and uh, integrity management services. And we also provide um, research and development activities in the field of risk and safety management. I'll now just sort of introduce Derek. So, so next slide, please, Derek. Uh, <laughs> probably not your, uh, your, your, your best uh, slide there, Derek, with your, your photo. <laughs> looking a little bit like you come straight out of prison there. Um, he, I can assure everybody it, it does actually look a lot more um, uh, friendlier than that. Uh, but Derek is our uh, principal human factors consultant. He's based in our UK office uh, in, uh, sorry, in our Warrington office in the UK. He's a chartered ergonomist and human factors specialist. Uh, he's got over 30 years of consultancy experience across a range of safety critical sectors, in particular, the oil and gas rail and nuclear industries. Uh, he's managed and delivered a, a wide range of projects over the years with some major corporations such as uh, Shell and Petrofac in the oil and gas sector, um, the Energy Institute uh, working on guidance around human factors, uh, the UK's regulator, the HSE, and then in the, nu in the nuclear sector, EDF Energy and, in, and uh, Network Rail as well. And not surprisingly, uh, Derek's expertise covers a whole raft of um, human factors specific services and uh, acronyms, as you can uh, see there. So with that uh, quick introduction, um, over to you, Derek. Uh, thanks, Steve. So um, today what we're going to talk about, as, as Steve said, is give you a bit of an introduction to, to human errors, human failures, human errors and violations. You know, what are they? What causes them? And what can we what can we do about it? So the old statement says to err to err is human. So which means we're all subject to to human errors. You can never completely eliminate uh, the potential for someone to make to make an error. It's always going to happen to some extent. And uh, human errors have been found to contribute to between 65 percent and 90 percent of accidents and incidents that happen. Um, in terms of defining them, you, you could talk about human errors as those occasions in which something you're planning to do in terms of what you're thinking about, your physical activities, fails to achieve its intended outcome. And they differ from violations in that violations are deliberate deviations from the rules and procedures. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail in a minute. 
So a good way to start thinking about human failures and human errors is to think about how we uh, f think about what we do. How do we carry out tasks? So if we're doing a brand new task for the first time, such as if the first time we ever get in a car and we have to drive a car, we're working on uh, a basis in which we don't really know what we're doing. So we're working on what we call the knowledge-based level of cognitive processing, how, how we think and how we uh, process information. So on that level there, we have no real instructions. We have no real idea about how to drive a car. It's, it's very novel. So we have to think about what do we need to do. We do a lot of decision making. It's a very uh, intensive process and we have to use a lot of our cognitive capabilities uh, and our cognitive resources in our mind to think about what we're doing. As we learn to drive a car, for instance, and we get used to what we're doing, we're moving to a more rule-based way of working. So we become familiar with a task, we'll have a set of rules that we can apply. So we sort of know if this happens, we do this. And an example would be, we're coming up to the traffic lights, we know that if, if it's a red light, we stop at a red light and we wait. As we go on and, and we're driving, say we're driving our car over many years, what we're doing predominantly is becoming a real automatic process. We don't really have to think about what we're doing. We don't think about, oh, I need to uh, apply the brake now. I need to change gears now. It becomes an automatic process. So as we become experienced, it's more and more automatic and we're requiring less and less of our conscious attention and less and less of our cognitive processing ability. And so that's how we work through our tasks. And we can think about that in terms of someone uh, out, out on the site or out on the plant, you know, you, you're developing, you're starting a process for the first time, you have to learn how to do it, then you're following your procedures, and then it's becoming a much more skill-based process. And at all these points, you've got the potential for human errors. So the reason we make our errors is because we have cognitive limitations, and what that means is the tasks that we do are reliant on our memory, and, and our ability to divert our attention between different sources of information. So if we have to do multiple tasks and we have to divert our attention between those tasks, we've only got a certain amount of ability to actually divert that attention. So the more tasks we do, the more we're dividing that resource, and that gives us the potential for, for errors. And similarly, if we're having to make those sort of decision-making, those problem-solving activities, particularly when we're looking at a complex task, that takes up a lot of our cognitive ability. And so all of the reasons for human errors arise because of these cognitive limitations that we have. And that's inbuilt into everybody has these. And we have to think about this, therefore, when we're designing tasks and take these limitations into account. So if we look at the the model we just showed about the, the processing level, we can see that at the knowledge base level, what we can have is we can make a mistake at that level. In a novel situation, we decide on what we should do, but our decision is incorrect because we're reliant on our experience and judgment, and we don't know much about that task yet, so we may you know, make the incorrect decision. When we get to a, a rule-based activity where we've, we've actually got a more procedural way of doing something, we can still make those mistakes because we're basically applying the rule incorrectly. And when we move to the more automatic activities that we talk about that become very sort of skill based, then we've still got the potential for error. And what happens here is we have slipses and lapses. These are sort of uh, errors that can occur even during these routine tasks that don't require any conscious effort. So if we categorize those types of human failures, they split into two types. The first type is unintentional actions. You can see on the right hand side of the slide, slide here. So this is unintentional actions. So it's not something we intend to do. Uh, so on a, on a slip and a lapse that we talked about at the skill based level. So the difference between a slip and a lapse is a lapse is something to do with a memory failure. So this would be an example would be if you forgot to close the petrol cap on a, on a, on a car, that, that might be a lapse. If you had a long series of valves 
on the plant that you had to go out and you had to close all these valves against the lineup, but you didn't have a checklist, so you you were reliant on your memory to mem remember to do it, then you might you might miss one of those out. That would be a lapse. A slip is something to do with an int attentional failure. So this is where we do the wrong thing by accident. And this is where, say, we go to reach for a tool and we, and we pick up the wrong tool accidentally. Or we go to look at a gauge and we, and we, and we look at the wrong, the wrong gauge. And the reason often is that we're being, we're being distracted and our attention is, is elsewhere and, and we just we make, that, make that error. Intentional actions are, are on the left hand side. So a mistake is still an error. But it's an intentional action in that we're deciding to actually actively go and do something. So we believe we've done the right thing, but we've made an incorrect judgment. So in this instance, we may deliberately say, well, I'm going to go and close. I'm going to go and press that button. Uh, and we make a deliberate choice to, to press the button, but we're misunderstanding the process and we, and we don't understand what we should be doing. So we're making the wrong judgment rather than accidentally doing it. And the difference between these errors and a violation is it's an intentional action, but we're knowingly breaking the rules. We're knowingly, we know that we're actually deviating from what we should, what we should do. So why do these deviations happen? We know about these errors that can happen. Well, we'll talk about why they can happen, but, but they're, they're things which we're not intentionally doing. Uh, different main causes of violations and going against the rule. Now, one of them would be, I didn't understand the rule. Or I was not aware of it. Uh, so in almost that that could be like a, a you know a, a knowledge based mistake really if we weren't if we didn't understand it. A key common reason for violations and perhaps the most common when you look into incidents are situational violations, and these are situations where the constraints of the workplace or the environment make it very difficult to carry out the rules as, as they're written or impossible to do so. So for instance, if our, if, if our rule means that we actually need to put our PPE on, but our PPE is on the other side of the plant and, and we need to stay in a particular room because of a, a lack of resource uh, that they can't free us up to, to, to move to the other side of the plant, then we may make a decision, well, I'd like to follow the rule, but I can't, it's too, it's too impractical really in terms of the time constraints that I've got, so I'm gonna take some shortcuts. And whether or not you take those shortcuts depends on whether it's a way of a normal way of working that's become the culture of the plant. So a routine violation would be where the rules on a particular site are seen as overly prescriptive or no longer applicable. And so it's seen as being acceptable within within the workforce to actually take these shortcuts and work around it. And it, if the workforce don't really appreciate the risks uh, accurately that uh, of doing things incorrectly then there's more likely that that would that would happen and the last one here just to talk about would be exceptional violations and this is where you have got these unusual or unique situations that you haven't been in before and you're really not clear how to proceed but rather than sort of stop you're going to proceed just to sort of do what you think is right and and uh, but knowingly go against the rule So errors and violations, um, those are some of the sort of reasons for them, for them occurring. The way in which they manifest themselves is in, is in the, the, the error that actually happens. So this list here is um, a taxonomy of external error modes. And over the years, in terms of uh, lots of the work that's been done on human errors, we've got a pretty good idea of the types of errors that can manifest. So what you see on this list are the sorts of action failures, like sort of slips that you could make or, or lapses that you can make where you might misalign something. Um, you, you may carry out action uh, to, you've got action too little. So when you're turning a wheel valve, you, you don't close it enough, maybe because you're distracted at, at the last moment. And you may have issues there with like check emitted, which is a, a C1, which is where you have a a, a, a lapse and again as you mentioned earlier you're looking at a long line of, of valves you haven't got a, a tool to help you to do that a job aid you forget one of the valves in the long list and, and you miss that check so these tend to be the sorts of manifestations of the errors 
um, that occur. And behind all these, as I've sort of talked about, are underlying psychological mechanisms. Here's an example, a real example of an error in the 2013 Malaysian Grand Prix. So Mercedes driver Lewis Hamilton had been in the uh, McLaren team until recently. And, du and during the Grand Prix, he actually went to make a pit stop and he, he drove into the McLaren team pit lane. Uh, and he said, here, I don't know how that happened. The teams look so similar. I've been stopping in that pit box for years. It's an easy mistake. And hopefully one, one I won't make again. And he, he soon realized his mistake and he drove along and he, and he stopped in the, the correct pit box. So if we look at our list of, that I showed earlier, the taxonomies, the error taxonomies, we can identify the sort of error that he made. And the sort of error that he, you could classify as it was right action on the wrong object. So the right action, i.e. He pulled over into the, into the pit stop, but the wrong object. So he actually picked the wrong pit lane to pull into. And the reason for that, if you use this flow chart that we have here, is you could see, well, what was the underlying cause of that? I mean, if you start at the top, you can see that was it a task which is similar to another task? Uh, yes, it, yes, it is. Is the other task more familiar than the present task? Yes, it is in this instance. And is the operator likely to switch into the familiar mode? Well, yes, and that's what he did. So, so really, the underlying mechanism here was a stereotype takeover. So, in this instance, he was so focused on that task of of, of running a good race, of driving the car, and thinking about all the things he needed to think about, that he sort of switched into that automatic mode, and he pulled into that that pit stop from from his his, his past team. So that's an example of an intentional uh, limitation, a, a slip. And so these sort of cognitive limitations we have provide opportunities for errors to occur. So the limitations that we have with memory, attention, decision making. But specific factors impact on these cognitive processes, making errors more or less likely. Because you can always make an error, but what makes it more likely to occur? And so the things we talk about are performance influencing factors. And you may see these called, see these called performance shaping factors. And what these are are factors, issues, which enhance or degrade human performance. So they increase the likelihood of errors occurring or decrease them. And so for any task that we're looking at, if we're thinking about can we have a human error, we want to think about well what are these performance influencing factors that may be out there? Are there any that apply, anything we know about? And we can use our understanding of those factors to work out how likely is it that we're going to have human failures. And equally they're, they're very important to understand because if we understand the factors which are really playing a part in increasing the likelihood of failures then obviously that's where we need to target our failure reduction measures. And so there's an awful lot of these performance shaped factors that you can you can examine and may play a part and in in the human factors the way in which we tend to look at things in human factors um, is dividing into factors associated with the person, such as their competence and their capabilities, the job and the task, um, and organizational factors. And I won't go into, into all of these here, but just as an example, for instance, if you had a human machine interface that was um, well designed, then it's not going to place a lot of requirement for the operator to have to remember a lot of information and keep it in his or her head. It's, it's going to make it very easy to operate. Similarly, procedures, if, they, if they're well written, you're, you're taking away a lot of that load on having to memorize things. So you're going to reduce the chance of those, those, those lapses. And things like fatigue and time pressure, um, if, you have, if, you ha if you are fatigued or you're feeling stressed because you're under uh, excessive workload or time pressure, these are things which have an impact on your cognitive abilities. So they make it much more likely you're going to have those sorts of failures. And a working environment issues, again, if you've got things like noise or, or something in the environment like that as a stressor, that could act as a, a distracting issue. So that could increase the chance of your, of your lapses. In terms of violations, the same applies with these performance shaping factors. And what you can look at here is there can be some reasons why violations would, hurt, would occur and then some other reasons which would increase or decrease 
the likelihood of them happening. So from an individual point of view, if you didn't understand a, a, a procedure, you weren't clear on it, that's going to make it more likely that you'll actually deviate from the correct steps to follow. And your perception of the risk is going to have an impact on whether you decide to do that or whether you say to someone, I don't really understand what, what I'm doing here. If a procedure is difficult to follow because of the way uh, it's been designed and it's out of date, again, situational violation gives you the opportunity to potentially deviate from that procedure. Whether or not you do so or not might depend on, am I under a lot of time pressure, so I, I have to get this done, so I'm going to have to take a shortcut. And pressure from management to get the task done may cause you to think about taking shortcuts. Whether or not everybody else in the, in the team does it, the peer pressure is going to be a factor that determines whether you do it too. So all these factors uh, play a part. And thinking about these performance influencing factors, what they, what they can do is, is lead um, to uh, human failures, uh, as we've talked about. And often those failures can be unsafe acts of, of people at the front end, i.e. the operators right at the sort of front end, you know, carrying out the job and have a slip or a lapse or a mistake, and it leads directly to an incident. But similarly, some of these factors, if they're not uh, if they're not addressed, you can result in latent failures or latent errors, and this means these are these are issues um, which are removed in time and space from the front line. But for instance, uh, failures in the senior management, uh, problems with the procedure, problems with maintenance. So they're sort of latent failures that could lead to unsafe plant conditions, and then they can influence the likelihood of those of those unsafe acts occurring. A good example would be um, uh, a failure to actually ad adequately under, uh, determine staffing levels um, would lead to a latent failure of perhaps jobs being incorrectly staffed, and that in turn would lead to operators being under excessive workload, and that in turn would re increase the likelihood that that would lead to them having a having a, having a, an error. So that's basically how human errors. Uh, are caused and, and how they lead to accidents. So how do you go about assessing them? Well, luckily, from the human factors point of view, we have well-established processes to, to look at these um, human failures, work out how likely they are, and decide what we need to do about, about them. And basically, that process is always the same process. The first thing we have to do is make sure we understand the task we're looking at, make sure we understand that in detail. And once we understand the task, what it is we're asking someone to do, then we can say, well, how likely is it that we're going to fail to do that thing that, that we're asking them to do? So understand the tasks that they're doing. How likely are we to fail on that task? That's the human failure identification. Once we identify the potential failures, we need to ask ourselves, well, how likely are they to occur and what would their consequence be? That's the human failure assessment. And then, of course, once you've done that, we, the most important thing, we need to determine how do we prevent these failures and how do we mitigate any consequences. So the human failure identification process, often what, we, what we're going to do is use these human error taxonomies, as we, as we saw earlier, to identify credible errors and human failure modes, because these taxonomies are going to cover most of the types of failures that could, that could happen. And typically that would be like a, a workshop approach with those uh, operators who are involved in the task and understand what's involved in it. So once you've picked out the sort of failures that could happen, we have to think what is the likelihood and consequence of these failures. So there's two ways we can assess this from a human failure uh, point of view. The first is a qualitative approach. And so a qualitative approach would be we use the expert judgment of the human factors person and the operators who are actually involved in carrying out that task and their knowledge of that activity that they're doing, knowledge of the environment they work in, uh, and use that and have a sort of workshop approach to evaluate the likelihood of human failure. That would give us a qualitative ranking of human failure. And we think about all those factors, all those PIFs, we identify the consequences, think about the current controls that we have, 
and the recovery mechanisms we have in place. And we ask ourselves, are these adequate then, given what we have, to actually reduce the risk associated with the human failures to, to an ALARP level? And then we determine if we need to take additional actions. And we determine the most appropriate and effective actions to address any credible failures. So the key thing we're focusing on here in a qualitative assessment is understanding the circumstance, the, the consequence, and whenever there's any credible failure, we're just saying, okay, what do we need to do then to actually eliminate that failure or reduce it, reduce its likelihood? Quantitative human failure assessment is effectively the same process. The difference is that we are attempting to quantify the likelihood of those failures. So we have a number of human reliability assessment techniques such as HART and FERP that we can use, which have tables of error error rates, and we can use to judge which task are we assessing, and we're, that, they'll give us an idea of the sorts of error rate, rates we can expect. We still think about the PIFs, um, and we have to understand which PIFs we think apply, and then we use that information to, to adjust those figures to give us a, a more accurate rate. And the quantified approach is required if you need to put a, a figure on a human error rate in a fault tree or a probabilistic safety assessment. But what I would say is there's still a, a large subjective judgment element uh, of that process, and it's still dependent on good quality information. And lastly, when we've, we've assessed the consequence, we understand what the factors are, we obviously have to identify the measures necessary to eliminate or reduce the potential for the failures. So we think about the nature of the failure, the error type, and our understanding of what the basis of it is. What's the effect of that? Is it an intentional thing? Is it a memory issue? And we'll think about all those PIFs we may have identified. And we ensure that our recommendations address those negative PIFs. And we think about all the factors in the individual aspects, the job aspects, and the organization. So if we understood that, if we identified rather that there was an issue with the environment, say the lighting was very poor and it could uh, it increase the like likelihood that someone would um, select the wrong gauge, then obviously our recommendation would be to address the, likely, the lighting. So our recommendations would be very much tied to the the understanding of the task and the plant and the factors that affected it. Okay, so that's really what I wanted to say. But in conclusion, the key points are to err is human. You cannot eliminate the potential for human error. There's always that potential and there's always a baseline opportunity for error. Cognitive limitations provide the opportunity for these errors to occur. The factors uh, in the working environment, the factors associated with the person, the organization, the PIFs, make these errors more or less likely. So human failure assessment is a systematic approach for identifying and assessing the impact of the potential failures. And it helps us identify the actions we need to take to reduce failure potential. And it does that by thinking about these error mechanisms and particularly thinking about these performance influencing factors and taking actions to address them. Okay. So um, I think that's it. Okay, thanks Derek. Um, you obviously covered a lot of ground there um, in a fairly short space of time. So we've got some questions come through. Um, so please, everybody, keep them coming. Use the instant messaging function. Uh, just let me pick out the first one. Yes. Um, in one of the early slides, you, this is a question from uh, Ayman. Yeah. Uh, in an earlier slide, you stated the term active failure. Yes. Uh, is that relevant to uh, Professor Reason's model of accident causation? Is that where it comes from? Yes, so so the difference really, it is also through Professor Reason's model, and the difference is an active failure is a failure by that person that's actually uh, the last line of defense against the task. So the person that's actually carrying out the task, if they have that slip or that lapse or make that mistake, that's an active failure. The difference is the latent failure is something that happened earlier in time. So it may be that latent failure is the procedure was 
wasn't updated correctly and so there were errors in it and that led to the increasing likelihood of that active failure. Okay, thanks. A uh, question from Gerald. Uh, how can an organization ensure that operators do not make the stereotype uh, kind of mistake that we saw Lewis Hamilton make? <laughs> do you know, I was, I, was, I was afraid someone was going to ask me that. Um, I think by making sure that um, recognizing where there's the opportunity for those sorts of errors to happen and addressing it. Now, the, the key example would really be uh, a human machine interface. So if you had an interface where you had uh, a number of different gauges or a number of different buttons, by no understanding that people might get used to one thing and then uh, and then do what they do what they revert to what they're more frequently used to doing you want to make sure that there's a there's a clear differentiation between the way in which you present things um and uh and differentiate that differentiate that way okay great another question from uh Ayman. uh for instance in workplaces human failure is a major contributor in the occurrence of incidents how can we establish a successful, effective, and realistic human failure analysis in, in our organization to break the chain of events? You know, wh where should we start? Um, yeah, well, where you start really, the, the, key, the answer to that is, is that you need to be thinking about human factors in the design of your systems and in the design of your processes. Because if you get human factors, say if you're just developing a new control room, for instance, um, once that control room is developed, if you haven't actually uh, designed it correctly, you may have provided yourself with the opportunity for these sort of errors to occur. And that might, that might be to do with the interfaces being not poorly designed or, or not, not well designed or um, issues with how you communicate within the control room. So the more you actually think about human factors when you are designing your systems and designing your processes and integrate that at the beginning, then you can ensure that those processes and systems are optimal in terms of minimizing the chance of human failures. And that would mean you, you've got less likely chance of those things happening because that's, that's the key answer, really. OK, thanks, Derek. Um, question from Abby. Can you assess human failures and the types of failures that could occur as part of a critical task analysis? Yes, absolutely. So, so say, particularly what we're talking about now a lot is safety critical task analysis that, that we do a lot of work on. And what that is, is effectively a, it is that qualitative human error analysis that we looked at. And so that would be that exact process where you, and the difference is with the critical task analysis is that you are focusing your analysis on those critical tasks. So you're looking to say which of our real critical tasks in terms of the ones that could lead to a major process safety hazard risk and then let's make sure that we've minimized the likelihood of error for those tasks because that where we're dependent on the person and the issue is that where your reliability is dependent on the person then you've got your subject to these areas so you need to focus it on that. Okay question from Naveen. Um, human reliability is an important factor when evaluating safety integrity levels, so SIL levels, mm -hmm. for safety instrumented functions, mm -hmm. especially for manually controlled or monitored operations such as level monitoring in storage tank farms. What's the best proven method to evaluate the human error probability for use in SIL assessments? So what I'd say is, um, I think I've, what I've seen for still assessments is sometimes I've seen the use of uh, sort of screening figures. So there are human factors, uh, human error probability screening values that you can use. But I would say that if you are determined to develop a, a, a quantitative assessment of human error, then you'd use one of the most validated techniques. So probably HARP, which is human error assessment and reduction approach, is one of the techniques that we would use. Um, so any of the human reliability assessment techniques that has some sort of area, some sort of validation to it, you could use to generate those those human errors. So the fact that it's for SIL levels doesn't really matter. What matters is the, the task that you are looking at that you're, you're claiming for, and then you assess it using a, a validated HRA approach. Thank you. Which leads nicely onto a question from Chris um, about HART, THERP, lots of acronyms, lots of yeah. acronyms here. Um, you just explain what HART means. Uh, FERP, what does that stand for? Technique for Human Error Rate pre Prediction. 
And the difference is, FERP is something that comes from the nuclear sector from quite quite a few years ago, really. Um, it mainly consists of a series of tables of um, types of task and um, baseline error rates for those tasks. And But what you do is you look at that, you also think of factors such as dependency between tasks, uh, the impact of stress and these performance influencing factors, and you use those to sort of calculate, calculate the rates. A uh, question from Naveen. Um, is there any literature explaining in detail these methods of heart and FERP? Uh, and a related question, is the learning curve steep for human reliability analysis? Um, Yes, so there is some literature, and we could probably post a link, probably actually, Steve, to, to that because the, we have we have got some links to it. What you will find is, I'd caveat it. There's some stuff which tells you about these techniques that's out there, and it also tells you the pros and cons of using them, and it gives you gives you the, the pros and cons. What I would say is, um, you want to be sort of fairly wary. In, what, what, what was the second question? Was it can we apply them? What would you? It, it, this, the second part was. Um, is the learning curve steep think, yes. for, 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 for undertaking human reliability analysis? Yeah, what I would say for that is you need to have a human factors sort of person to, to sort of do it, I think, uh, in the, because you need the sort of background in the human error thing. So, so I think that the learning curve is probably steep in that I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyone does a heart analysis or a FERP analysis without having a human factors person uh, involved in it because that's part of the, the sort of basis for the reliability of these techniques. Um, personally, with myself, I tend to avoid whenever I can. I avoid the quantification of human error, and I do I do the qualitative approach that I was I was talking about. And for that qualitative approach, the learning curve is is really not not quite so steep, you know, because we can teach how, how to sort of go around that systematic process of looking at the sort of errors and uh, and working out what you need to, to do about them. So, so a qualitative approach is, is a bit of an uh, easier thing to learn. Okay, question for Martin. Um, is it fair to say that failure will happen and therefore the system should be fail safe? Yeah, absolutely. So, well, really what you should assume is it is it's fairly likely. So when, when you tend to look at, um, when you do this error analysis then and you, and you look and you say, well, there is a credible error here, the first thing you're going to do is say, well, can we completely eliminate this? It may be if, you, if you're dependent on a person carrying out a task and we know that it is credible that they could fail to do this correctly because of various factors, the first thing to ask ourselves is, well, can we eliminate the person then? Can we just automate this? Or if we can't do that, can can we actually, you know, eliminate the eliminate the uh, the risk by having an in, if the person does it wrong, having an interlock or, or whatever that would actually stop it happening, stop anything, uh, the consequence from accelerating. So really, you you apply that hierarchy of of control, and whenever you can, you would you should be designing to actually eliminate the person or, or try and design out the opportunity for failure. And what you want to do really is you, you don't want to be in a situation where you're, you're reliant on a procedural control where you have the person being your uh, your main means of um, have, you know, having to do it correctly to, to um, ensure the failure doesn't happen. Okay, and uh, I think this is a follow-up question from Ayman. Um, how can we establish a successful, effective, and realistic human failure analysis in the workplace? Which I think was kind of the same question that was asked before. Yeah. Uh, but I think they've qualified it now to say, you know, the approach to the assessment will be rather reactive and based on the occurrence of incidents uh -huh. caused by human failure. So I think he's... Yeah, so I talked about... about... Yeah, go on. No, sorry, you, can, you finish what you were about to say, actually. Well, I think, I think my interpretation of the question is that they're trying to get an understanding of... Um, to what extent are you starting from a clean sheet of paper, and then to what extent do you do you build on the actual evidence of human failure that you're observing in the workplace? Yeah, so I, so I, so I think I talked about there building human factors into the design process, and, and equally building into if if you are looking at your your activities that you carry out, you can you can be doing the human failure analysis, is what we tend to do a lot now, in, in looking at the activities that you carry out, and then you are you're identifying the potential for human failures to catch them before they would happen. So you can build that into your process uh, whenever you've got a new activity and whether you're making changes to an activity. If you've actually had human failures happen, then obviously you, you could have the human factors involved in the instant investigation, the 
accident investigation process. And that should, if you do that effectively, should lead you to identify these sort of factors that we talked about that may be the underlying causes of those incidents. And then you can take the necessary actions to address them. So if you say so if you came down with your incident investigation, which said um, this chap at the, the operator made this error, but you, you looked into it and it told you the actual underlying cause was um, a failure to... Um, you know, have the procedure updated, which meant that he was doing the wrong thing, then obviously you, you've got your action to take on modifying the procedure. So it's the same process that you could apply for incident investigation effectively. Okay, um, and, and I'll, I'll just wrap up with a question of my own, because somebody asked me this uh, the other day. Um, that, uh, you know, if, if your organisation has got a problem with rule breaking, so basically deliberate violation, a, a deliberate violation, and it's quite common. I mean, what strategy would you recommend to deal with that? So I would say on that one, the, the key, the, the first thing would be to try and understand what what was causing it, really. So there'd be an investigation there to find out is there anything obvious as to why. So that that thing we talked about about the, the procedures being out of date. You know, if that if that turned out to be an easy easy thing, that that was the reason why, because they're rule breaking because the rules aren't correct and they can't be followed that might be an easy win but i think the thing would be to investigate that and try and get to the bottom of it and if it came down to um it might come down to a sort of a, a cultural thing uh, and then you'd be looking at saying well what is it we need to do which might which might be saying well we need to actually design our tasks more effectively so so um you, you don't need to break the rules and that may be to do with resourcing planning of tasks at a sufficient time so you really can't say exactly what it would be but the key thing would be to investigate it and try and get to the bottom of what's of what's causing it understanding these sort of factors that we talked about in terms of violations okay great great Derek um, thank you for answering all of those questions we've kind of just just about run over our time actually a little bit by a couple of minutes um, so I think we need to uh, wrap up now. Um, as I mentioned on the instant messaging, uh, we will make a recording available to everybody next week. You get an email with that. Um, if you do have any questions arising from what you've heard today, uh, or you'd like any information on uh, our, our services or the human factor services, then do please uh, email us directly. I think, Derek, if you just advance the slides, there's, um, there's a couple of email uh, addresses on there or just visit our website and there's loads of forms you can find on there to, to ask us questions or get in contact. Um, right, so thanks again, Derek, um, and thank you everybody for your attention. Uh, we appreciate you spending the time with us today, taking your time out from your busy schedules. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and uh, stay secure. Goodbye. <laughs>